Welcome back, guys. More creepy tech talks, and let's dive in. Take your children out of school. The government school system is not only a failure, it is irredeemable. The school system is controlled, utterly controlled, by teachers' unions and advocates, meaning those who go into the schools to proselytize their political ideology on your children. They have no other purpose, no other function, and they have taken over entirely. We would be better off if all Americans pulled their kids out of the government schools and either did homeschooling or built their own schools in their local communities. That would cause the corrupt, rotten, termite-infested structure to finally collapse on its own weight, and then we could rebuild on a local level from the ground up. I love the passion this man has for hatred towards the educational system, and he's right, he's completely right. The only difference is in today's society, they want your boy to become a girl and your girl to become a boy. They want to groom them, and they also want your wee ones to like the same kind. Elvis's former bodyguards revealed that Elvis not only believed that he had occultic powers, but that he was a prophet and that they were his disciples. Red West declared he likes to be in control. He likes to be a god figure. For many years, with real seriousness, he called us his disciples. Red West declared with conviction that Elvis possessed some kind of special powers, something like psychic powers, he said. Elvis proved it to me again and again. A John Lennon, the leader of the most popular band of all times. Uh, basically, Chad, I mean, uh, from his youth, uh, feeling he was in touch with spirits, uh, saying that he, as he was a musician, that when he wrote songs, he said, I felt like a psychic, a medium, that I was possessed. He said he was like a hollow temple. One spirit would come into him, and then that spirit would leave his body. Then another spirit would come into him, possess his body, then that spirit would leave. So that He put Aleister Crowley up the top left, back row of Sgt. Pepper's Only Hearts Club band. Aleister Crowley was a full-blown Satanist, and he's saying the whole Beatle idea was to do Crowley's deal, and I think it's quite interesting when you think about this. They said that Elvis is psychic, so what I want to know is, did Elvis know that out of all those number ones he was going to have, that it was going to be a number two that was going to kill him? Piece by part of that plan, of course, is to induce the gradual surrender of American sovereignty, piece by piece and step by step, to various international organizations of which the United Nations is the outstanding, but far from the only example. Now, here are the aims for the United States. One, greatly expanded government spending for every conceivable means of getting rid of ever larger sums of American money as wastefully as possible. Two, higher and then much higher taxes. Three, an increasingly unbalanced budget, despite the higher taxes. Four, wild inflation of our currency. Five, government controls of prices, wages, and materials supposedly to combat inflation. Six, greatly increased socialistic controls over every operation of our economy and every activity of our daily lives. This is to be accompanied naturally and automatically by a correspondingly huge increase in the size of our bureaucracy and in both the cost and reach of our domestic government. Seven, far more centralization of power in Washington and the practical elimination of our state lines. There is a many faceted drive at work to have our state lines eventually mean no more within the nation than our county lines do now within the states. Eight, the steady advance of federal aid to and control over our educational system, leading to complete federalization of our public education. Nine, a constant hammering into the... Nine, a constant hammering into the American consciousness of the horror of modern warfare the beauties and the absolute necessity of peace. Peace always on communist terms, of course. And 10, the consequent willingness of the American people to allow the steps of appeasement by our government, which amount to a piecemeal surrender of the rest of the free world and of the United States itself. You know, when you fast forward in today's world, you can clearly see how much of this has come to fruition. And and the truth is, that's way back in the 50s. So we've been their target for at least 70, 80 years. And it's also evident that during that period, 
it's quite clear that they've always made us believe that our enemies have always been overseas but the truth is our enemies have always been in our backyard and we're the ones that are voting for them so it's unfortunate for every one of us really like this is how retarded this country is getting okay the nhs flag with 21 different sexes on the same flag 21 different versions of different sexes even though there's only two and yet you people are going to take health advice off these people yeah you people are going to listen to them when they tell you to take their tablets and their jabs <laughs> Oh, God. This is by far one of the most pathetic things I've ever seen come from the NHS. I mean, first of all, you're a healthcare system. So why are you, you know, showing examples of flags? And what kind of relation does flags have with these anyway? There is no relation. So it's clear that it's complete propaganda at this point. So my mother was showing me that she opened a banana that she thinks that these are not real bananas. We got it from the supermarket. But when she opens it, and she breaks it in half, it gets very tough and doesn't really break. And if, when it pulls, it's like it's glue. It's very tight and doughy. I've never ever seen a banana like that. I don't know if it's just our banana or if it's this brand from Costco. From Costco, but at the end of the day, it looks very, very fake and play doughy. Yeah, that definitely is a bit strange, man. I don't think I've ever had a banana that does that. Hold on. Not as big as you think. <sighs> Good. No? No? So... Just... <coughs> what were you thinking about, you adore defect, are you? Justine Bieber and Jaden Smith, the son of Will Smith, were seen at Coachella together, giving each other a little kiss and dance. These celebrities are just getting way too comfortable recently. Men, stay manly. Maybe it's just me, but Justin actually looked afraid of Jaden. But regardless, there's no man that would ever tolerate something like that, no matter how close you are as a mate. And Boise, if you ever did that to me, do you know what I would do to you, boy? I would give you a big kiss and tell you how much I love you and then I would say bend over, I'm going first. This is nuts! And I have a very high tolerance for nuts. And this, everyone, is why Hubba Bubba's flavors only last less than five minutes. So definitely a fear on lock for some of you guys, for sure. Three dead bodies were found stuffed into this hollowed out tree in the middle of the woods in 2010. And when it came to who the murderer was, truth is stranger than fiction. This is Matthew Hoffman, and in November of 2010, he murdered three people and kidnapped a 13-year-old girl who he held hostage for days. On November 9th, 2010, Matthew went into the woods and spent the night camping. Then the next morning on November 10th, he decided to wake up and break into the home of Tina Herman. So unfortunately that day, when Tina Herman returned to her house, Matthew Hoffman had broken in. And as soon as he saw her, he freaked out, dragged her into a bedroom and stabbed her multiple times with a hunting knife, killing her. But what Matthew didn't know was that Tina's friend Stephanie was coming over to meet her that morning. And while Matthew was dealing with Tina and her dead body, Stephanie entered the residence. Matthew freaked out. He stabbed Stephanie a number of times with the same hunting knife, even continuing to stab her after she was dead. And hearing all of this, the family's dog started to bark violently, and Matthew then stabbed and killed the family dog as well. After this, he dragged both of the women's bodies into the bathroom, dismembered them in the tub along with the body of the dog, and stuffed the body parts into trash bags. 
Shortly after finishing the dismemberment process, though, Tina's two children, Cody and Sarah, arrived home from school. Immediately after walking into their house, Matthew stabbed Cody in the back of the head, killing him instantly, then chased Sarah up into her room where he bound and gagged her with a cord from a fan in her room. So after dismembering Cody's body and stuffing him into a trash bag as well, Matthew brought out the three bodies that he had chopped up and placed into garbage bags, stored them in his car, and then brought out Sarah, who was still alive. After this, he brought Sarah and the bodies of Tina, Stephanie, and Cody back to his own house where he kept Tina locked in a crawl space. And this is where the story gets really weird. So Matthew Hoffman was a self-professed tree lover and his entire home was covered in leaves. I'm talking about piles of leaves, bags of leaves nailed to the walls. And apparently, according to his neighbors at the time, Matthew had exhibited some really strange behavior prior to the murders. He had apparently been trapping squirrels in his backyard, killing them and grilling them. He allegedly spent hours sitting up in the trees in his backyard, just staring at the other trees and watching squirrels. And for a while, he had actually worked as a professional tree trimmer. But let's get back to the story. So after bringing Sarah back to his house, along with the bodies of the other people he had killed, he locked her in a bathroom and even tied himself to her and took a nap. Afterwards, he headed back to the crime scene, did some cleanup, and then eventually brought Sarah into a crawl space, which was once again covered in leaves, dark and damp. And while she was chained up and held hostage inside of this crawl space, for days, he visited her regularly and would S.A. her. Keep in mind, at the time, Sarah was only 13 years old, and her mom, her brother, and her family friend had been murdered right in front of her. Finally, though, a few days later, Matthew was arrested after police found him parked in his own car right next to the abandoned car of one of his victims. Tina, Coda, Sarah, and Stephanie had been missing for days now, so the police obviously went and searched Matthew's house, and that's when they made the gruesome discovery of Sarah chained up in the crawl space. This is an actual photo that the police released eventually of Sarah exactly as they found her. They actually had to take these photos for evidence before they released her, and they obviously immediately arrested Matthew. So for a while after his arrest, Matthew would not release the location of the bodies to the police. They were desperately trying to find the bodies of those people that he had killed, but he wouldn't tell them anything. That is, until they took the death penalty off the table, and that's when he revealed that he had stuffed the three corpses into a hollowed out tree in the middle of the woods. Police immediately then went and found the tree, and inside they found the bodies of Cody, Stephanie, and Tina in those trash bags, dismembered. Eventually, the tree was torn down, but I mean, how bizarre is this story? Eventually, Matthew Hoffman was sentenced to life in prison without parole, and this whole story is just kind of mind-blowing. He's been nicknamed the Leaf Killer for doing the things that he did, for his obsession with leaves, the way that he placed the bodies inside of a hollowed-out tree trunk. I've never really heard a story like this, and I hope to never hear one like this again. I've watched a lot of true crime stories in the past, and honestly, that is probably one of the weirdest stories out there. Uh, for sure and that poor girl Sarah I mean you know yes she's alive but the fact that she has to live her life you know experiencing that trauma every day would just be a nightmare you know as for that guy I mean I'm convinced when people do stuff like this there's definitely some form of demonic possession or something that's going on in their lives that possesses them to do this because it's just not normal if you enjoy compilations just like this go ahead and smash that subscribe button and tickle the notification bell for the next upload Cosmopolitan life in London. The mainstream of workers flows towards the offices of leather merchants, dress manufacturers and filmmakers. As in other parts of London where the same trades and profession get together, Soho has its own business communities, one of the most noted being textiles. Quite early, the street markets get going again. Every morning, the flower stalls are dolled up afresh with choice blooms from Cotton Garden, and it's quite a business unloading them and making an attractive window show where there isn't any window. This trader has been doing just that all his life, and always on the same pitch. There's hardly anything portable you can't pick up in the markets. One of the busiest is Berwick Market, a narrow ribbon of street where you can buy nearly everything from a cabbage to a corn blaster. If it's a dress length or a bit of curtaining, you will find both in great variety. Or if you want something to put on a horse, 
Well, there are the very shirts. As with flowers, so the fruit and vegetables. While shops may have classier products, there's always a great show of the more homelier kind, such as these lovely ripe tomatoes. Shopping is at its height, and these stalls are doing a thriving trade with their aubergine, sweet peppers and chicken. Who'd like some morning gathered mushrooms? In and around the market streets, you will find everything for a modest menu. And you need never go short of garlic. A lot of us will never know what it'd be like to live back in that era, but I can only imagine, you know, you would have had class and intelligence and beauty. And when you think of health and safety in your own country, this kind of video would be it. <laughs> These people are selling water uh, that we think it's purified, coming from the toilet. What the hell is this thing? What the hell is this thing? In a tax shop. What the hell is this thing? What the hell is this thing? What the hell is this? This is the water that they are selling for the people. In the name of oh, purified water. <laughs> and they are selling to the communities. Oh, Our communities are just eating or drinking water that is coming from the oh, pilot. <laughs> These people. That is rank high. I mean, do you see the state of that toilet? I mean, can you imagine actually going there, taking a drink, and then going up to them and saying, Look, Excuse me, sir, but I took a drink of your purified water and I've got these brown lumps stuck in my teeth. Can you tell me what that is? A lot of a random guy arrested in St. Louis for trespassing. But when your name is Bud Weiser, no kidding, and you're arrested for trespassing at the Budweiser Brewery, no kidding, it becomes a little more interesting. He is 19 years old and was taken into custody. <laughs> But why is her guy? But he definitely should have got a job there, like for sure. I'm hoping that was from some sort of film, but honestly, the realism of that skin and those faces was just downright creepy. Like, thrilled for Amanda. 
because Amanda should never have been charged. The and criminal charges were dropped against a Holbrook nurse who was accused last year of mishandling a newborn baby. The incident was caught on camera and the nurse was fired from her job. A proud dad videotaping his two-day-old through the NICU window at Good Samaritan Hospital was horrified to capture what the Suffolk DA described as a nurse violently slam him face down into his bassinet. Amanda Burke was charged with endangering the welfare of a child. On Monday, those charges were dismissed. I'm just happy it's over. It was a nightmare. I was harassed. Yes. Um, you felt harassed? And it's not over, it's just beginning. Um, people at my door, letters in the mail, emails. Um, I have an eight-year-old. Bitch, you weren't thinking about your eight-year-old when you did that to the two-day-old baby. Now your child has to live with that. Everywhere she goes, she's going to get bullied. That's your karma. I felt like she was endangered. Did you forget that you put the baby in danger also? Burke, surrounded by family, was hugged by her attorney who said they've been begging for a dismissal since February 2023, when Burke admitted to flipping the baby by its diaper. Most they can say is that by turning the baby over by the diaper was negligent, but it didn't even rise to the level to issue a warning to sanction her in any way. In court, prosecutors revealed a child advocacy expert expressed profound disgust and shock, but found the defendant's action not likely to be injurious to the infant. The Suffolk DA said, unfortunately, despite the disturbing video, the New York State Department of Licensing found the defendant did not act with gross negligence. As such, we could not prove the charge beyond a reasonable doubt. And, says Burke's attorney, the baby wasn't harmed. The baby was cleared, was not injured, did not even react, didn't even cry. The baby's grandmother told CBS2, we are very, very upset with this disgusting situation and decision about my grandson and this awful woman still working as a caregiver. She's a great nurse. She's a great person. And I never question myself when things happen in the hospital every day. Good Samaritan Hospital, which fired Burke within hours of the incident, says she's no longer working for any Catholic health facility. But she retains her license and is working as a registered nurse. In Central Islip, Long Island, Carolyn Gussoff, CBS 2 News. Regardless of where you work in the healthcare system, whether you're a registered nurse, a midwife, or whatever you may be, you never treat an infant the way she treated that infant. I mean, come on, common sense would tell you, you know, what way to treat an infant or even a baby for that matter. And the fact that she came out and tried to play the victim in all this just tells me everything you need to know about that person. Now a question. What have Herbert Hoover, Art Linkletter, Jack London, and Richard Nixon all had in common? Well, they've all been members of the exclusive all-male Bohemian Club in California, where every year at this time, the elite from around the country get together for two and a half weeks of uh, fun and games. Steve Shepard has this special assignment report. More than 2,000 members of San Francisco's exclusive and all-male Bohemian Club have once again descended on Northern California. These men will spend most of the month of July encamped on some 2,700 acres of pristine and privately owned redwood forest. Forest very much like this. The place is called Bohemian Grove, and it's located just 80 miles north of San Francisco. The Grove is the Bohemian Club's summer retreat, and its facilities are hidden beneath lush forest canopy extending south from the banks of Sonoma County's Russian River. For more than a century, the camp has been a place where club members and guests from all across America gather to relax. The retreat is divided into dozens of small camps, the most prominent of which is called Mandalay. Among its members are businessmen like Leonard Firestone and Edgar Kaiser, and political figures like Gerald Ford, Henry Kissinger, William French Smith, and George Shultz. President Reagan, Vice President Bush, and Defense Secretary Weinberger are members of other camps. Richard Nixon is a bohemian, so are high-ranking executives of such companies as Eastern Airlines, Standard Oil of Indiana, and Bank of America. For the most part, the men of Bohemian Grove are over 50, highly successful, and, according to many employees, politically conservative. Well, each year, uh, many of them seem to have a stunt, uh, or try to come up with a stunt. Last year, 1980, uh, the popular button was uh, Free the Fortune 500. Membership in the Grove is by invitation only and is determined by such factors as social standing, occupation, and personal connections. Privacy is one of the Grove's most cherished virtues. Members may not photograph, record, speak, or write about activities at the retreat. 
While many public officials are Grove members, the press is a distinctly unwelcome guest. We're from ABC News. Well, get back there. Get back there. Can we talk to somebody in there? Get back there. Anyone willing to navigate a boat up the Russian River can get a glimpse of the northern edge of the compound, but that's about all. Still, there are outsiders who have researched the Grove. Sociology professor William Dumhoff found out enough to write a book on the place. Well, I think it's a playground for the powerful. It's a place where uh, wealthy men from all of the United States gather for two weeks to uh, relive summer camp with this ceremony called the Cremation of Care that uh, begins the, uh, the uh, two-week encampment where the body of dull care symbolizing woes and concerns is burned on an altar in front of a big owl statue. When that ceremony ends, they all start to cheer and yell and hand each other a beer. And... Other regular activities include the production of two plays, one of which involves major sets, orchestral music, and extravagant costumes. The other play appears to be just a bit on the lighter side, at least judging from these old photos. Members also spend time swimming, hiking, relaxing in the sun, and doing a bit of drinking from the Grove's own privately labeled spirits. Like a boys' camp, the Grove has a symbol, in this case, a somewhat fierce-looking owl. It also has a patron saint, St. John of Nepomuk, a legitimate 13th-century bohemian canonized for his sense of honor. What the Grove does not have is any women, not even as employees. Despite its camp-like atmosphere, the Grove does host some serious business. To the degree that there's anything important happens at the Bohemian Grove, it's political. The important speeches that have been made by, at the Bohemian Grove have been made, for instance, and the best example by Richard Nixon. Eisenhower gave a speech there. It was the first time the uh, West Coast establishment really saw him close up. Discussions at the Grove in the 1930s helped lead to the development of nuclear power and the atomic bomb. It was at the Grove in 1967 that Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan hashed out differences over their presidential ambitions. Each year, guests like Henry Kissinger or Spigniew Brzezinski address members on their areas of expertise. Presidential Counselor Edwin Meese will be among this year's speakers. And each year, other guests come to the Grove simply to enjoy themselves. This year, CIA Director William Casey is a scheduled guest of John McCone, former CIA Director. Baseball Commissioner Bowie Kuhn has been invited as a guest of baseball owner Peter O'Malley. Despite the presence of so many notables, the Grove is not without its small headaches. Anti-nuclear demonstrators gathered near the entrance to the retreat this year to wave signs and chant slogans. The Grove is also facing a suit from the state of California because it refuses to hire women. Still, the Bohemian Grove seems in no danger of passing. Herbert Hoover called it the world's greatest men's party, and there is a list of powerful people waiting to get in on it. Steve Shepard, ABC News, San Francisco. I wonder if we'll ever get any kind of leaked footage or leaked information about what really goes on there. You know, I understand that there's a lot of rituals that take place and a lot of, you know, child, uh, etc, etc, and that kind of thing. But I'm really curious to see what will ever come out of there. Um, but yeah, wild is a wild place. Like. That's it for today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the creepy TikTok compilation. And go ahead and smash that subscribe button and tickle the notification bell for the next upload. But until then, guys, please look after yourselves. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I'll see you then.